Chapter 48 The Opening of the Sight of Jesus Death of the Two Thieves Whilst these events were taking place in Jerusalem, silence reigned around Calvary. The crowd which had been for a time so noisy and tumultuous was dispersed. All were panic-stricken. In some that panic had produced sincere repentance, but on others it had no beneficial effects. Mary, John, Magdalene, Mary of Cleophas, and Salome had remained, either standing or sitting before the cross, closely veiled and weeping silently. A few soldiers were leaning over the terrace which enclosed the platform. Cassius rode up and down, the sky was lowering, and all nature wore a garb of mourning. Six archers soon after made their appearance, bringing with them ladders, spades, ropes, and large iron staves for the purpose of breaking the legs of the criminals in order to hasten their deaths. When they approached our Lord's cross, his friends retired a few paces back, and the Blessed Virgin was seized with fear, lest they should indulge their hatred of Jesus by insulting even his dead body. Her fears were not quite unfounded, for when they first placed their ladders against the cross, they declared that he was only pretending to be dead. In a few moments, however, seeing that he was cold and stiff, they left him, and removed their ladders to the crosses on which the two thieves were still hanging alive. They took up their iron staves and broke the arms of the thieves above and below the elbow, while another archer at the same moment broke their legs, both above and below the knee. Gesmus uttered frightful cries. Therefore the executioner finished him off by three heavy blows of a cudgel on his chest. Dismas gave a deep groan and expired. He was the first among mortals who had the happiness of rejoining his Redeemer. The cords were then loosened, the two bodies fell to the ground, and the executioners dragged them to a deep morass, which was between Calvary and the walls of the town, and buried them there. The archers still appeared doubtful whether Jesus was really dead, and the brutality they had shown in breaking the legs of the thieves made the holy women tremble as to what outrage they might perpetrate on the body of our Lord. But Cassius, the subaltern officer, a young man of about five and twenty, whose weak, squinting eyes and nervous manner had often excited the derision of his companions, was suddenly illuminated by grace, and being quite overcome at the sight of the cruel conduct of the soldiers and the deep sorrow of the holy women, determined to relieve their anxiety by proving beyond dispute that Jesus was really dead. The kindness of his heart prompted him, but unconsciously to himself he fulfilled a prophecy. He seized his lance and rode quickly up to the mound on which the cross was planted, stopped just between the cross of the good thief and that of our Lord, and taking his lance in both hands, thrust it so completely into the right side of Jesus that the point went through the heart and appeared on the left side. When Cassius drew his lance out of the wound, a quantity of blood and water rushed from it and flowed over his face and body. This species of washing produced effects somewhat similar to the vivifying waters of baptism. Grace and salvation at once entered his soul. He leaped from his horse, threw himself upon his knees, struck his breast, and confessed loudly before all his firm belief in the divinity of Jesus. The Blessed Virgin and her companions were still standing near, with their eyes fixed upon the cross. But when Cassius thrust his lance into the side of Jesus, they were much startled and rushed with one accord up to it. Mary looked as if the lance had transfixed her heart instead of that of her divine son and could scarcely support herself. Cassius, meantime, remained kneeling and thanking God, not only for the grace he had received, but likewise for the cure of the complaint in his eyes, which had caused the weakness and the squint. This cure had been effected at the same moment that the darkness with which his soul was previously filled was removed. Every heart was overcome at the sight of the blood of our Lord, which ran into a hollow in the rock at the foot of the cross. Mary, John, the holy women, and Cassius gathered up the blood and water in flasks and wiped up the remainder with pieces of linen. Cassius, whose sight was perfectly restored at the same moment that the eyes of his soul were opened, was deeply moved and continued his humble prayer of thanksgiving. The soldiers were struck with astonishment at the miracle which had taken place, and cast themselves on their knees by his side, at the same time striking their breasts and confessing to Jesus. The water and blood continued to flow from the large wound in the sight of our Lord. It ran into the hollow in the rock, 
and the holy women put it in vases, while Mary and Magdalene mingled their tears. The archers who had received a message from Pilate, ordering them not to touch the body of Jesus, did not return at all. All these events took place near the cross, at a little before four o'clock, during the time that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were gathering together the articles necessary for the burial of Jesus. But the servants of Joseph, having been sent to clean out the tomb, informed the friends of our Lord that their master intended to take the body of Jesus and place it in his new sepulcher. John immediately returned to the town with the holy women, in the first place that Mary might recruit her strength a little, and in the second to purchase a few things which would be required for the burial. The Blessed Virgin had a small lodging among the buildings near the Sennaculum. They did not re-enter the town through the gate which was nearest to Calvary because it was closed and guarded by soldiers placed there by the Pharisees, but they went through that gate which leads to Bethlehem. Chapter 49 A Description of Some Parts of Ancient Jerusalem This chapter will contain some descriptions of places given by Sister Emmerich on various occasions. They will be followed by a description of the tomb and garden of Joseph of Arimathea, that so we may have no need to interrupt the account of the burial of our Lord. The first gate which stood on the eastern side of Jerusalem, to the south of the southeast angle of the temple, was the one leading to the suburb of Ophel. The gate of the sheep was to the north of the northeast angle of the temple. Between these two gates there was a third, leading to some streets situated to the east of the temple and inhabited for the most part by stonemasons and other workmen. The houses in these streets were supported by the foundations of the temple, and almost all belonged to Nicodemus, who had caused them to be built and who employed nearly all the workmen living there. Nicodemus had not long before built a beautiful gate as an entrance to these streets, called the Gate of Moriah. It was but just finished, and through it Jesus had entered the town on Palm Sunday. Thus he entered by the new gate of Nicodemus, through which no one had yet passed, and was buried in the new monument of Joseph of Arimathea, in which no one had yet been laid. This gate was afterwards walled up, and there was a tradition that the Christians were once again to enter the town through it. Even in the present day, a walled-up gate, called by the Turks the Golden Gate, stands on this spot. The road leading to the west from the gate of the sheep passed almost exactly between the northwestern side of Mount Sion and Calvary. From this gate to Golgotha, the distance was about two miles and a quarter, and from Pilate's palace to Golgotha, about two miles. The fortress Antonia was situated to the northwest of the mountain of the temple on a detached rock. A person going towards the west, on leaving Pilate's palace, would have had this fortress to his left. On one of its walls there was a platform commanding the forum, and from which Pilate was accustomed to make proclamations to the people. He did this, for instance, when he promulgated new laws. When our divine Lord was carrying his cross in the interior of the town, Mount Calvary was frequently on his right hand. This road, which partly ran in a southwesterly direction, led to a gate made in an inner wall of the town toward Zion. Beyond this wall, to the left, there was a sort of suburb, containing more gardens than houses, and towards the outer wall of the city stood some magnificent sepulchres with stone entrances. On this side was a house belonging to Lazarus, with beautiful gardens, extending towards that part where the outer western wall of Jerusalem turned to the south. I believe that a little private door made in the city wall, and through which Jesus and his disciples often passed by permission of Lazarus, led to these gardens. The gate standing at the northwestern angle of the town led to Bethshur, which was situated more towards the north than Emmaus and Joppa. The western part of Jerusalem was lower than any other. The land on which it was built first sloped in the direction of the surrounding wall, and then rose again when close to it. And on this declivity there stood gardens and vineyards, behind which wound a wide road with paths leading to the walls and towers. On the other side, without the wall, the land descended towards the valley, so that the walls surrounding the lower part of the town looked as if built on a raised terrace. There are gardens and vineyards even in the present day on the outer hill. When Jesus arrived at the end of the way of the cross, he had on his left hand that part of the town where there were so many gardens, and it was from thence that Simon of Cyrene was coming when he met the procession. The gate by which Jesus left the town was not entirely facing the west, but rather the southwest. The city wall on the left-hand side, after passing through the gate, ran somewhat in a southerly direction, then turned towards the west, and then again to the south, round Mount Sion. On this side there stood a large tower like a fortress. 
The gate by which Jesus left the town was at no great distance from another gate more towards the south, leading down to the valley, and where a road, turning to the left in the direction of Bethlehem, commenced. The road turned to the north towards Mount Calvary shortly after that gate by which Jesus left Jerusalem when bearing his cross. Mount Calvary was very steep on its eastern side facing the town, and a gradual descent on the western. And on this side, from which the road to Emmaus was to be seen, there was a field, in which I saw Luke gather several plants when he and Cleophas were going to Emmaus and met Jesus on the way. Near the walls, to the east and south of Calvary, there were also gardens, sepulchres, and vineyards. The cross was buried on the northeast side at the foot of Mount Calvary. The Garden of Joseph of Arimathea was situated near the gate of Bethlehem, at about a seven minutes' walk from Calvary. It was a very fine garden, with tall trees, banks, and thickets in it, which gave much shade, and was situated on a rising ground extending to the walls of the city. A person coming from the northern side of the valley and entering the garden had on his left hand a slight ascent extending as far as the city wall, and on his right, at the end of the garden, a detached rock, where the cave of the sepulchre was situated. The grotto in which it was made looked to the east, and on the southwestern and northwestern sides of the same rock were two other smaller sepulchres, which were also new and with depressed fronts. A pathway beginning at the western side of this rock ran all around it. The ground in front of the sepulchre was higher than that of the entrance, and a person wishing to enter the cavern had to descend several steps. The cave was sufficiently large for four men to be able to stand close up to the wall on either side without impeding the movements of the bearers of the body. Opposite the door was a cavity in the rock in which the tomb was made. It was about two feet above the level of the ground and fastened to the rock by one side only, like an altar. Two persons could stand, one at the head and one at the foot, and there was a place also for a third in front, even if the door of the cavity was closed. This door was made of some metal, perhaps of brass, and had two folding doors. These doors could be closed by a stone being rolled against them, and the stone used for this purpose was kept outside the cavern. Immediately after our Lord was placed in the sepulchre, it was rolled in front of the door. It was very large and could not be removed without the united effort of several men. Opposite the entrance of the cavern there stood a stone bench, and by mounting on this a person could climb onto the rock, which was covered with grass, and from whence the city walls, the highest parts of Mount Zion, and some towers could be seen, as well as the gate of Bethlehem and the fountain of Gihon. The rock inside was of a white color, intersected with red and blue veins. Chapter 50 The Descent from the Cross At the time when everyone had left the neighborhood of the cross and a few guards alone stood around it, I saw five persons who I think were disciples and who had come by the valley from Bethania draw nigh to Calvary, gazed for a few moments upon the cross, and then steal away. Three times I met in the vicinity two men who were making examinations and anxiously consulting together. These men were Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. The first time was during the crucifixion, perhaps when they caused the clothes of Jesus to be brought back from the soldiers, and they were then at no great distance from Calvary. The second was when, after standing to look whether the crowd was dispersing, they went to the tomb to make some preparations. The third was on their return from the tomb to the cross, when they were looking around in every direction as if waiting for a favorable moment, and when concerted together as to the manner in which they should take the body of our Lord down from the cross, after which they returned to the town. Their next care was to make arrangements for carrying with them the necessary articles for embalming the body, and their servants took some tools with which to detach it from the cross, as well as two ladders which they found in a barn close to Nicodemus's house. Each of these ladders consisted of a single pole crossed at regular intervals by pieces of wood which formed the steps. There were hooks which could be fastened on any part of the pole, and by means of which the ladder could be steadied, or on which perhaps anything required for the work could also be hung. The woman from whom they had bought their spices had packed the whole neatly together. Nicodemus had bought a hundred pounds weight of roots, which quantity is equal to about thirty-seven pounds of our measure, as has been explained to me. They carried these spices in little barrels made of bark, which were hung round their necks and rested on their breasts. One of these barrels contained some sort of powder. They had also some bundles of herbs in bags made of parchment or leather, 
And Joseph carried a box of ointment, but I do not know what this box was made of. The servants were to carry vases, leathern bottles, sponges, and tools on a species of litter, and they likewise took fire with them in a closed lantern. They left the town before their master and by a different gate, perhaps that of Bethania, and then turned their steps toward Mount Calvary. As they walked through the town, they passed by the house where the Blessed Virgin, St. John, and the holy women had gone to seek different things required for embalming the body of Jesus, and John and the holy women followed the servants at a certain distance. The women were about five in number, and some of them carried large bundles of linen under their mantles. It was the custom for women, when they went out in the evening, or if intending to perform some work of piety secretly, to wrap their persons in a long sheet at least a yard wide. They began by one arm, and then wound the linen so closely round their body that they could not walk without difficulty. I have seen them wrapped up in this manner, and the sheet not only extended to both arms, but likewise veiled the head. On the present occasion the appearance of this dress was most striking in my eyes, for it was a real mourning garment." Joseph and Nicodemus were also in mourning attire, and wore black sleeves and wide sashes. Their cloaks, which they had drawn over their heads, were both wide and long, of a common gray color, and served to conceal everything that they were carrying. They turned their steps in the direction of the gate leading to Mount Calvary. The streets were deserted and quiet, for terror kept everyone at home. The greatest number were beginning to repent, and but few were keeping the festival. When Joseph and Nicodemus reached the gate, they found it closed, and the road, streets, and every corner lined with soldiers. These were the soldiers whom the Pharisees had asked for at about two o'clock, and whom they had kept under arms and on guard, as they still feared a tumult among the people. Joseph showed an order signed by Pilate to let them pass freely, and the soldiers were most willing that they should do so, but explained to him that they had endeavored several times to open the gate without being able to move it, that apparently the gate had received a shock and been strained in some part, and that on this account the archers sent to break the legs of the thieves had been obliged to return to the city by another gate. But when Joseph and Nicodemus seized hold of the bolt, the gate opened as if of itself, to the great astonishment of all the bystanders. It was still dark, and the sky cloudy when they reached Mount Calvary, where they found the servants who had been sent on already arrived, and the holy women sitting weeping in front of the cross. Cassius and several soldiers who were converted remained at a certain distance, and their demeanor was respectful and reserved. Joseph and Nicodemus described to the Blessed Virgin and John all they had done to save Jesus from an ignominious death, and learned from them how they had succeeded in preventing the bones of our Lord from being broken, and how the prophecy had been fulfilled. They spoke also of the wound which Cassius had made with his lance, No sooner was the centurion Abinadar arrived than they began, with the deepest recollection of spirit, their mournful and sacred labor of taking down from the cross and embalming the adorable body of our Lord. The Blessed Virgin and Magdalene were seated at the foot of the cross, while on the right-hand side, between the cross of Dismas and that of Jesus, the other women were engaged in preparing the linen, spices, water, sponges, and vases. Cassius also came forward and related to Abinadar the miraculous cure of his eyes. All were deeply affected, and their hearts overflowing with sorrow and love. But at the same time they preserved a solemn silence, and their every movement was full of gravity and reverence. Nothing broke the stillness save an occasional smothered word of lamentation or a stifled groan, which escaped from one or other of these holy personages, in spite of their earnest eagerness and deep attention to their pious labor. Magdalene gave way unrestrainedly to her sorrow, and neither the presence of so many different persons nor any other consideration appeared to distract her from it. Nicodemus and Joseph placed the ladders behind the cross and mounted them, holding in their hands a large sheet, to which three long straps were fastened. They tied the body of Jesus below the arms and knees to the tree of the cross and secured the arms by pieces of linen placed underneath the hands. They then drew out the nails by pushing them from behind with strong pins pressed upon the points. The sacred hands of Jesus were thus not much shaken, and the nails fell easily out of the wounds, for the latter had been made wider by the weight of the body, which being now supported by the cloths no longer hung on the nails. The lower part of the body, which since our Lord's death had sunk down on the knees, now rested in a natural position, supported by a sheet fastened above to the arms of the cross. 
whilst Joseph was taking out the nail from the left hand and then allowing the left arm supported by its cloth to fall gently down upon the body, Nicodemus was fastening the right arm of Jesus to that of the cross, as also the sacred crowned head, which had sunk on the right shoulder. Then he took out the right nail, and having surrounded the arm with its supporting sheet, let it fall gently on to the body. At the same time, the centurion of Benadar, with great difficulty, drew out the large nail which transfixed the feet. Cassius devoutly received the nails and laid them at the feet of the Blessed Virgin. Then Joseph and Nicodemus, having placed ladders against the front of the cross in a very upright position and close to the body, untied the upper strap and fastened it to one of the hooks on the ladder. They did the same with the two other straps, and passing them all on from hook to hook, caused the sacred body to descend gently towards the centurion, who, having mounted upon a stool, received it in his arms, holding it below the knees. While Joseph and Nicodemus, supporting the upper part of the body, came gently down the ladder, stopping at every step and taking every imaginable precaution, as would be done by men bearing the body of some beloved friend who had been grievously wounded. Thus did the bruised body of our divine Savior reach the ground. It was a most touching sight. They all took the same precautions, the same care, as if they had feared to cause Jesus some suffering. They seemed to have concentrated on the sacred body all the love and veneration which they had felt for their Savior during His life. The eyes of each were fixed upon the adorable body and followed all its movements, and they were continually uplifting their hands towards heaven, shedding tears and expressing in every possible way the excess of their grief and anguish. Yet they all remained perfectly calm, and even those who were so busily occupied about the sacred body broke silence but seldom, and when obliged to make some necessary remark, did so in a low voice. During the time that the nails were being forcibly removed by blows of the hammer, the Blessed Virgin, Magdalene, and all those who had been present at the crucifixion felt each blow transfix their hearts. The sound recalled to their minds all the sufferings of Jesus, and they could not control their trembling fear, lest they should again hear his piercing cry of suffering. Although at the same time they grieved at the silence of his blessed lips, which proved, alas, too surely, that he was really dead. When the body was taken down, it was wrapped in linen from the knees to the waist, and then placed in the arms of the Blessed Virgin, who, overwhelmed with sorrow and love, stretched them forth to receive their precious burden. Chapter 51 the embalming of the body of Jesus. The Blessed Virgin seated herself upon a large cloth spread on the ground, with her right knee, which was slightly raised, and her back resting against some mantles, rolled together so as to form a species of cushion. No precaution had been neglected which could in any way facilitate to her the mother of sorrows in her deep affliction of soul, the mournful but most sacred duty which she was about to fulfill in regard to the body of her beloved Son. The adorable head of Jesus rested upon Mary's knee, and his body was stretched upon a sheet. The Blessed Virgin was overwhelmed with sorrow and love. Once more, and for the last time, did she hold in her arms the body of her most beloved Son, to whom she had been unable to give any testimony of love during the long hours of his martyrdom and she gazed upon his wounds and fondly embraced his blood-stained cheeks while Magdalene pressed her face upon his feet. The men withdrew into a little cave situated on the southwest side of Calvary, there to prepare the different things needful for the embalming. But Cassius, with a few other soldiers who had been converted, remained at a respectful distance. All ill-disposed persons were gone back to the city, and the soldiers who were present served merely to form a guard to prevent any interruption in the last honors which were being rendered to the body of Jesus. Some of these soldiers even gave assistance when desired. The holy women held the vases, sponges, linen, unction, and spices according as required, but when not thus employed, they remained at a respectful distance, attentively gazing upon the Blessed Virgin as she proceeded in her mournful task. Magdalene did not leave the body of Jesus, but John gave continual assistance to the Blessed Virgin and went to and fro from the men to the women, lending aid to both parties. The women had with them some large leathern bottles and a vase filled with water standing upon a coal fire. They gave the Blessed Virgin and Magdalene, according as they required, vases filled with clear water and sponges, which they afterwards squeezed in the leathern bottles. 
The courage and firmness of Mary remained unshaken even in the midst of her inexpressible anguish. It was absolutely impossible for her to leave the body of her son in the awful state to which it had been reduced by his sufferings, and therefore she began with indefatigable earnestness to wash and purify it from the traces of the outrages to which it had been exposed. With the utmost care she drew off the crown of thorns, opening it behind, and then cutting off one by one the thorns which had sunk deep into the head of Jesus, in order that she might not widen the wounds. The crown was placed by the side of the nails, and then Mary drew out the thorns which had remained in the skin with a species of rounded pincers, and sorrowfully showed them to her friends. These thorns were placed with the crown, but still some of them must have been preserved separately. The divine face of our Savior was scarcely recognizable. So disfigured was it by the wounds with which it was covered. The beard and hair were matted together with blood. Mary washed the head and face and passed damp sponges over the hair to remove the congealed blood. As she proceeded in her pious office, the extent of the awful cruelty which had been exercised upon Jesus became more and more apparent and caused in her soul emotions of compassion and tenderness which increased as she passed from one wound to another. She washed the wounds of the head, the eyes filled with blood, the nostrils and the ears with a sponge and small piece of linen spread over the fingers of her right hand, and then she purified in the same manner the half-open mouth, the tongue, the teeth, and the lips. She divided what remained of our Lord's hair into three parts, a part falling over each temple, and the third over the back of his head, and when she had disentangled the front hair and smoothed it, she passed it behind his ears. When the head was thoroughly cleansed and purified, the Blessed Virgin covered it with a veil, after having kissed the sacred cheeks of her dear son. She then turned her attention to the neck, shoulders, chest, back, arms, and pierced hands. All the bones of the breast and the joints were dislocated and could not be bent. There was a frightful wound on the shoulder which had borne the weight of the cross, and all the upper part of the body was covered with bruises and deeply marked with blows of the scourges. On the left breast there was a small wound where the point of Cassius's lance had come out, and on the right side was the large wound made by the same lance, and which had pierced the heart through and through. Mary washed all these wounds, and Magdalen on her knees helped her from time to time, but without leaving the sacred feet of Jesus, which she bathed with tears and wiped with her hair. The head, bosom, and feet of our Lord were now washed, and the sacred body, which was covered with brown stains and red marks in those places where the skin had been torn off, and a bluish-white color, like flesh that has been drained of blood, was resting on the knees of Mary, who covered the parts which she had washed with a veil, and then proceeded to embalm all the wounds. The holy women knelt by her side, and in turn presented to her a box, out of which she took some precious ointment, and with it filled and covered the wounds. She also anointed the hair, and then, taking the sacred hands of Jesus in her left hand, respectfully kissed them, and filled the large wounds made by the nails with this ointment or sweet spice. She likewise filled the ears, nostrils, and wound in the side with the same precious mixture. Meanwhile Magdalene wiped and embalmed our Lord's feet, and then again washed them with her tears, and often pressed her face upon them. The water which had been used was not thrown away, but poured into the leathern bottles in which the sponges had been squeezed. I saw Cassius or some other soldier go several times to fetch fresh water from the fountain of Gihon, which was at no great distance off. When the Blessed Virgin had filled all the wounds with ointment, she wrapped the head up in linen cloths, but she did not as yet cover the face. She closed the half-open eyes of Jesus and kept her hand upon them for some time. She also closed the mouth, and then embraced the sacred body of her beloved son, pressing her face fondly and reverently upon his. Joseph and Nicodemus had been waiting for some time, when John drew near to the Blessed Virgin, and besought her to permit the body of her son to be taken from her, that the embalming might be completed, because the Sabbath was close at hand. Once more did Mary embrace the sacred body of Jesus, and utter her farewells in the most touching language, and then the men lifted it from her arms on the sheet and carried it to some distance. The deep sorrow of Mary had been for the time assuaged by the feelings of love and reverence with which she had accomplished her sacred task. But now it once more overwhelmed her, and she fell, her head covered with her veil, into the arms of the holy women. 
Magdalene felt almost as though her beloved were being forcibly carried away from her, and hastily ran forward a few steps, with her arms stretched forth, but then, after a moment, returned to the Blessed Virgin. The sacred body was carried to a spot beneath the level of the top of Golgotha, where the smooth surface of a rock afforded a convenient platform on which to embalm the body. I first saw a piece of open-worked linen, looking very much like lace, and which made me think of the large embroidered curtain hung between the choir and nave during Lent. It was probably worked in that open stitch for the water to run through. I also saw another large sheet unfolded. The body of our Savior was placed on the open-worked piece of linen, and some of the other men held the other sheet spread above it. Nicodemus and Joseph then knelt down, and underneath this covering took off the linen which they had fastened round the loins of our Savior when they took his body down from the cross. They then passed sponges under this sheet and washed the lower parts of the body, after which they lifted it up by the help of pieces of linen crossed beneath the loins and knees and washed the back without turning it over. They continued washing until nothing but clear water came from the sponges when pressed. Next they poured water of myrrh over the whole body, and then, handling it with respect, stretched it out full length, for it was still in the position in which our divine Lord had died, the loins and knees bent. They then placed beneath his hips a sheet, which was a yard in width and three in length, laid upon his lap bundles of sweet-scented herbs, and shook over the whole body a powder which Nicodemus had brought. Next they wrapped up the lower part of the body and fastened the cloth which they had placed underneath round it strongly. After this they anointed the wounds of the thighs, placed bundles of herbs between the legs which were stretched out to their full length, and wrapped them up entirely in these sweet spices. Then John conducted the Blessed Virgin and the other holy women once more to the side of the body. Mary knelt down by the head of Jesus and placed beneath it a piece of very fine linen which had been given her by Pilate's wife and which she had worn round her neck under her cloak. Next, assisted by the holy women, she placed from the shoulders to the cheeks bundles of herbs, spices, and sweet-scented powder, and then strongly bound this piece of linen round the head and shoulders. Magdalene poured besides a small bottle of balm into the wound of the side, and the holy women placed some more herbs into those of the hands and feet. Then the men put sweet spices around all the remainder of the body, crossed the sacred stiffened arms on the chest, and bound the large white sheet round the body as high as the chest, in the same manner as if they had been swaddling a child. Then, having fastened the end of a large band beneath the armpits, they rolled it round the head and the whole body. Finally, they placed our divine Lord on the large sheet, six yards in length, which Joseph of Arimathea had bought, and wrapped him in it. He was lying diagonally upon it, and one corner of the sheet was raised from the feet to the chest, the other drawn over the head and shoulders, while the remaining two ends were doubled round the body. The Blessed Virgin, the Holy Women, the men, all were kneeling round the body of Jesus to take their farewell of it when a most touching miracle took place before them. The sacred body of Jesus, with all its wounds, appeared imprinted upon the cloth which covered it, as though he had been pleased to reward their care and their love and leave them a portrait of himself through all the veils with which he was enwrapped. With tears they embraced the adorable body and then reverently kissed the wonderful impression which it had left. Their astonishment increased when on lifting up the sheet they saw that all the bands which surrounded the body had remained white as before and that the upper cloth alone had been marked in this wonderful manner. It was not a mark made by the bleeding wounds, since the whole body was wrapped up and covered with sweet spices, but it was a supernatural portrait, bearing testimony to the divine creative power ever abiding in the body of Jesus. I have seen many things relative to the subsequent history of this piece of linen, but I could not describe them coherently. After the resurrection, it remained in the possession of the friends of Jesus, but fell twice into the hands of the Jews, and later was honored in several different places. I have seen it in a city of Asia, in the possession of some Christians who were not Catholics. I have forgotten the name of the town, which is situated in a province near the country of the Three Kings. Chapter 52 The Body of Our Lord Placed in the Sepulcher The men placed the sacred body on a species of leathern handbarrow, which they had covered with a brown-colored cloth, and to which they fastened two long stakes. This forcibly reminded me of the Ark of the Covenant, Nicodemus and Joseph bore on their shoulders the front shafts, while Abinadar and John supported those behind. 
After them came the Blessed Virgin, Mary of Heli, her eldest sister, Magdalene, and Mary of Cleophas, and then the group of women who had been sitting at some distance, Veronica, Johanna Chusa, Mary Salome, Salome of Jerusalem, Susanna, and Anne, the niece of St. Joseph. Cassius and the soldiers closed the procession. The other women, such as Marone of Naim, Dina the Samaritaness, and Mara the Siphonitaness, were at Bethania with Martha and Lazarus. Two soldiers bearing torches in their hands walked on first that there might be some light in the grotto of the sepulchre, and the procession continued to advance in this order for about seven minutes, the holy men and women singing psalms in sweet but melancholy tones. I saw James the Greater, the brother of John, standing upon a hill the other side of the valley to look at them as they passed, and he returned immediately afterwards to tell the other disciples what he had seen. The procession stopped at the entrance of Joseph's garden, which was opened by the removal of some stakes, afterwards used as levers to roll the stone to the door of the sepulchre. When opposite the rock, they placed the sacred body on a long board covered with a sheet. The grotto, which had been newly excavated, had been lately cleaned by the servants of Nicodemus, so that the interior was neat and pleasing to the eye. The holy women sat down in front of the grotto, while the four men carried in the body of our Lord, partially filled the hollow couch destined for its reception with aromatic spices, and spread over them a cloth, upon which they reverently deposited the sacred body. After having once more given expression to their love by tears and fond embraces, they left the grotto. Then the Blessed Virgin entered, seated herself close to the head of her dear son, and bent over his body with many tears. When she left the grotto, Magdalene hastily and eagerly came forward and flung on the body some flowers and branches which she had gathered in the garden. Then she clasped her hands together and with sobs kissed the feet of Jesus. But the men having informed her that they must close the sepulchre, she returned to the other women. They covered the sacred body with the extremities of the sheet on which it was lying, placed on the top of all the brown coverlet, and closed the folding doors, which were made of a bronze-colored metal, and had on their front two sticks, one straight down and the other across, so as to form a perfect cross. The large stone with which they intended to close the sepulchre, and which was still lying in front of the grotto, was in shape very like a chest or tomb. Its length was such that a man might have laid himself down upon it, and it was so heavy that it was only by means of levers that the men could roll it before the door of the sepulchre. The entrance of the grotto was closed by a gate made of branches twined together. Everything that was done within the grotto had to be accomplished by torchlight, for daylight never penetrated there. Chapter 53 The Return from the Sepulchre Joseph of Arimathea is put in prison. The Sabbath was close at hand and Nicodemus and Joseph returned to Jerusalem by a small door not far from the garden, and which Joseph had been allowed by special favor to have made in the city wall. They told the Blessed Virgin, Magdalene, John, and some of the women who were returning to Calvary to pray there, that this door, as well as that of the supper room, would be open to them whenever they knocked. The elder sister of the Blessed Virgin, Mary of Heli, returned to the town with Mary the mother of Mark and some other women. The servants of Nicodemus and Joseph went to Calvary to fetch several things which had been left there. The soldiers joined those who were guarding the city gate near Calvary, and Cassius went to Pilate with a lance, related all that he had seen, and promised to give him an exact account of everything that should happen if he would put under his command the guards whom the Jews would not fail to ask to have put round the tomb. Pilate listened to his words with secret terror, but only told him in reply that his superstition amounted to madness. Joseph and Nicodemus met Peter and the two Jameses in the town. They all shed many tears, but Peter was perfectly overwhelmed by the violence of this grief. He embraced them, reproached himself for not having been present at the death of our Savior, and thanked them for having bestowed the rites of sepulture upon his sacred body. It was agreed that the door of the supper room should be opened to them whenever they knocked, and then they went away to seek some other disciples who were dispersed in various directions. Later I saw the Blessed Virgin and her companions enter the supper room. A Benadar next came and was admitted, and by degrees the greatest part of the apostles and disciples assembled there. The holy women retired to that part of the building where the Blessed Virgin was living. They took some food and spent a few minutes more in tears and in relating to one another what each had seen. The men changed their dresses, and I saw them standing under the lamp and keeping the Sabbath. 
They ate some lambs in the supper room, but without observing any ceremony, for they had eaten the paschal lamb the evening before. They were all perturbed in spirit and filled with grief. The holy women also passed their time in praying with the Blessed Virgin under the lamp. Later, when night had quite fallen, Lazarus, the widow of Naim, Dina the Samaritan woman, and Mara of Sufan came from Bethania, and then once more descriptions were given of all that had taken place, and many tears shed. Joseph of Arimathea returned home late from the supper room, and he was sorrowfully walking along the streets of Zion, accompanied by a few disciples and women, when all on a sudden a band of armed men who were lying in ambuscade in the neighborhood of Caiaphas's tribunal fell upon them and laid hands upon Joseph, whereupon his companions fled, uttering loud cries of terror. He was confined in a tower contiguous to the city wall, not far from the tribunal. These soldiers were pagans and had not to keep the Sabbath, therefore Caiaphas had been able to secure their services on this occasion. The intention was to let Joseph die of hunger and keep his disappearance a secret. Here conclude the descriptions of all that occurred on the day of the Passion of our Lord, but we will add some supplementary matter concerning Holy Saturday, the descent into hell, and the resurrection. Chapter 54 On the Name of Calvary Whilst meditating on the name of Golgotha, Calvary, the place of skulls, borne by the rock upon which Jesus was crucified, I became deeply absorbed in contemplation, and beheld in spirit all ages from the time of Adam to that of Christ, and in this vision the origin of the name was made known to me. I here give all that I remember on this subject. I saw Adam, after his expulsion from paradise, weeping in the grotto where Jesus sweated blood and water on Mount Olivet. I saw how Seth was promised to Eve in the grotto of the manger at Bethlehem, and how she brought him forth in that same grotto. I also saw Eve living in some caverns near Hebron, where the Essenian monastery of Masfa was afterwards established. I then beheld the country where Jerusalem was built, as it appeared after the deluge, and the land was all unsettled, black, stony, and very different from what it had been before. At an immense depth below the rock which constitutes Mount Calvary, which was formed in this spot by the rolling of the waters, I saw the tomb of Adam and Eve. The head and one rib were wanting to one of the skeletons, and the remaining head was placed within the same skeleton to which it did not belong. The bones of Adam and Eve had not all been left in this grave, for Noah had some of them with him in the ark, and they were transmitted from generation to generation by the patriarchs. Noah and also Abraham were in the habit, when offering sacrifice, of always laying some of Adam's bones upon the altar to remind the Almighty of his promise. When Jacob gave Joseph his variegated robe, he at the same time gave him some bones of Adam to be kept as relics. Joseph always wore them on his bosom, and they were placed with his own bones in the first reliquary which the children of Israel brought out of Egypt. I have seen many similar things, but some I have forgotten, and the others time fails me to describe. As regards the origin of the name of Calvary, I here give all I know. I beheld the mountain which bears this name as it was in the time of the prophet Eliseus. It was not the same then as at the time of our Lord's crucifixion, but was a hill with many walls and caverns resembling tombs upon it. I saw the prophet Eliseus descend into these caverns. I cannot say whether in reality or only in a vision, and I saw him take out a skull from a stone sepulcher in which bones were resting. Someone who was by his side, I think an angel, said to him, This is the skull of Adam. The prophet was desirous to take it away, but his companion forbade him. I saw upon the skull some few hairs of a fair color. I learned also that the prophet, having related what had happened to him, the spot received the name of Calvary. Finally, I saw that the cross of Jesus was placed vertically over the skull of Adam. I was informed that this spot was the exact center of the earth, and at the same time I was shown the numbers and measures proper to every country, but I have forgotten them individually as well as in general. Yet I have seen this center from above, and as it were from a bird's eye view. In that way a person sees far more clearly than on a map all the different countries, mountains, deserts, seas, rivers, towns, and even the smallest places, whether distant or near at hand. Chapter 55 The Cross and the Wine Press. As I was meditating upon these words or thoughts of Jesus when hanging on the cross, I am pressed like wine placed here under the press for the first time. My blood must continue to flow until water comes, 
but wine shall no more be made here. An explanation was given me by means of another vision relating to Calvary. I saw this rocky country at a period anterior to the deluge. It was then less wild and less barren than it afterwards became, and was laid out in vineyards and fields. I saw there the patriarch Japhet, a majestic, dark-complexioned old man, surrounded by immense flocks and herds and a numerous posterity. His children, as well as himself, had dwellings excavated in the ground and covered with turf roofs, on which herbs and flowers were growing. There were vines all around, and a new method of making wine was being tried on Calvary, in the presence of Japhet. I saw also the ancient method of preparing wine, but I can give only the following description of it. At first men were satisfied with only eating the grapes, then they pressed them with pestles and hollow stones, and finally in large wooden trenches. Upon this occasion a new wine press, resembling the holy cross in shape, had been devised. It consisted of the hollow trunk of a tree placed upright, with a bag of grapes suspended over it. Upon this bag there was fastened a pestle, surmounted by a weight. And on both sides of the trunk were arms joined to the bag, through openings made for the purpose, and which, when put in motion by lowering the ends, crushed the grapes. The juice flowed out of the tree by five openings, and fell into a stone vat, from whence it flowed through a channel made of bark and coated with resin, into the species of cistern excavated in the rock where Jesus was confined before his crucifixion. At the foot of the wine-press, in the stone vat, there was a sort of sieve to stop the skins, which were put on one side. When they had made their wine-press, they filled the bag with grapes, nailed it to the top of the trunk, placed the pestle, and put in motion the side arms, in order to make the wine flow. All this very strongly reminded me of the crucifixion, on account of the resemblance between the wine-press and the cross. They had a long reed, at the end of which there were points, so that it looked like an enormous thistle, and they ran this through the channel and trunk of the tree when there was any obstruction. I was reminded of the lance and sponge. There were also some leathern bottles, and vases made of bark and plastered with resin. I saw several young men, with nothing but a cloth wrapped around their loins like Jesus, working at this wine-press. Japhet was very old. He wore a long beard and a dress made of the skins of beasts, and he looked at the new wine-press with evident satisfaction. It was a festival day, and they sacrificed on a stone altar some animals which were running loose in the vineyard, young asses, goats, and sheep. It was not in this place that Abraham came to sacrifice Isaac. Perhaps it was on Mount Moriah. I have forgotten many of the instructions regarding the wine, vinegar, and skins, and the different ways in which everything was to be distributed to the right and to the left. And I regret it, because the various trifles in these matters have a profound symbolical meaning. If it should be the will of God for me to make them known, he will show them to me again. Chapter 56 Apparitions on Occasion of the Death of Jesus Among the dead who rose from their graves, and who were certainly a hundred in number, at Jerusalem there were no relations of Jesus. I saw in various parts of the Holy Land others of the dead appear and bear testimony to the divinity of Jesus. Thus I saw Sadduck, a most pious man, who had given all his property to the poor and to the temple, appear to many persons in the neighborhood of Hebron. This Sadduck had lived a century before Jesus and was the founder of a community of Essenians. He had ardently sighed for the coming of the Messiah and had had several revelations upon the subject. I saw some others of the dead appear to the hidden disciples of our Lord and give them different warnings. Terror and desolation reigned even in the most distant parts of Palestine, and it was not in Jerusalem only that frightful prodigies took place. At Thirza, the towers of the prison in which the captives delivered by Jesus had been confined fell down. In Galilee, where Jesus had traveled so much, I saw many buildings, and in particular the houses of those Pharisees who had been the foremost in persecuting our Savior, and who were then all at the festival, shaken to the ground, crushing their wives and children. Numerous accidents happened in the neighborhood of the lake of Gennesareth. Many buildings fell down at Capernaum, and the wall of rocks which was in front of the beautiful garden of the centurion Zerubbabel cracked across. The lake overflowed into the valley, and its waters descended as far as Capernaum which was a mile and a half distant. Peter's house and the dwelling of the Blessed Virgin in front of the town remained standing. 
The lake was strongly convulsed. Its shores crumbled in several places, and its shape was very much altered, and became more like what it is at the present day. Great changes took place, particularly at the southeastern extremity, near Tarichia, because in this part there was a long causeway made of stones between the lake and a sort of marsh which gave a constant direction to the course of the Jordan when it left the lake. The whole of this causeway was destroyed by the earthquake. Many accidents happened on the eastern side of the lake, on the spot where the swine belonging to the inhabitants of Gergesa cast themselves in, and also at Gergesa, Garasa, and in the entire district of Chorazin. The mountain where the second multiplication of the loaves took place was shaken, and the stone upon which the miracle had been worked split in two. In Decapolis, whole towns crumbled to the earth, and in Asia, in several localities, the earthquake was severely felt, particularly to the east and northeast of Paneus. In Upper Galilee, many Pharisees found their houses in ruins when they returned from keeping the feast. A number of them, while yet at Jerusalem, received the news of what had happened. And it was on that account that the enemies of Jesus made such very slight efforts against the Christian community at Pentecost. A part of the temple of Gerizim crumbled down. An idol stood there above a fountain in a small temple, the roof of which fell into the fountain with the idol. Half of the synagogue of Nazareth, out of which Jesus had been driven, fell down, as well as that part of the mountain from which his enemies had endeavored to precipitate him. The bed of the Jordan was much changed by these shocks, and its course altered in many places. At Machaerus and the other towns belonging to Herod, everything remained quiet, for that country was out of the sphere of repentance and of threats, like those men who did not fall to the ground in the Garden of Olives, and consequently did not rise again. In many other parts where there were evil spirits, I saw the latter disappear in large bodies amid the falling mountains and buildings. The earthquakes reminded me of the convulsions of the possessed, when the enemy feels that he must take to flight. At Gergesa, a part of the mountain from which the devils had cast themselves with the swine into a marsh fell into this same marsh, and I then saw a band of evil spirits cast themselves into the abyss like a dark cloud. It was at Nice, unless I am mistaken, that I saw a singular occurrence, of which I have only an imperfect remembrance. There was a port there with many vessels in it, and near this port stood a house with a high tower, in which I saw a pagan whose office was to watch these vessels. He had often to ascend this tower and see what was going on at sea. Having heard a great noise over the vessels in the port, he hurriedly ascended the tower to discover what was taking place, and he saw several dark figures hovering over the port, and who exclaimed to him in plaintive accents, if thou desirest to preserve the vessels, cause them to be sailed out of this port, for we must return to the abyss. The great Pan is dead. They told him several other things, laid injunctions upon him to make known what they were then telling him upon his return from a certain voyage which he was soon to take, and to give a good reception to the messengers who would come to announce the doctrine of him who had just died. The evil spirits were forced in this manner by the power of God to inform this good man of their defeat and announce it to the world. He had the vessels put in safety, and then an awful storm arose. The devils cast themselves howling into the sea, and half the city fell down. His house remained standing. Soon afterwards he went on a great journey, and announced the death of the great Pan, if that is the name by which our Savior had been called. Later he came to Rome, where much amazement was caused by what he related. His name was something like Thamus or Thramus. Chapter 57 Guards are placed around the tomb of Jesus. Late on Friday night, I saw Caiaphas and some of the chief men among the Jews holding a consultation concerning the best course to pursue with regard to the prodigies which had taken place and the effect they had had upon the people. They continued their deliberations quite into the morning, and then hurried to Pilate's house, to tell him that, as that seducer said while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again, it would be right to command the sepulcher to be guarded until the third day, as otherwise his disciples might come and steal him away, and say to the people, He is risen from the dead, and the last error would be worse than the first. Pilate was determined to have nothing more to do with the business, and he only answered, You have a guard. Go, guard it as you know. However, he appointed Cassius to keep a watch over all that took place, and give him an exact account of every circumstance. 
I saw these men, twelve in number, leave the town before sunrise, accompanied by some soldiers who did not wear the Roman uniform, being attached to the temple. They carried lanterns fastened to the end of long poles, in order that they might be able to see every surrounding object in spite of the darkness of the night, and also that they might have some light in the dark cave of the sepulchre. No sooner had they reached the sepulchre than having first seen with their own eyes that the body of Jesus was really there, they fastened one rope across the door of the tomb and a second across the great stone which was placed in front, sealing the hole with a seal of half-circular shape. They then returned to the city, and the guards stationed themselves opposite the outer door. They were five or six in number, and watched three and three alternately. Cassius never left his post, and usually remained sitting or standing in front of the entrance to the cave, so as to see that side of the tomb where the feet of our Lord rested. He had received many interior graces, and been given to understand many mysteries. Being wholly unaccustomed to the state of spiritual enlightenment, he was perfectly transported out of himself, and remained nearly all the time unconscious of the presence of exterior things. He was entirely changed, and became a new man, and spent the whole day in penance, in making fervent acts of gratitude, and in humbly adoring God.